Well, Zach, welcome to the ODAT Chad podcast. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to have you. You're coming to us from Hawaii, Maui. What's it like there today? Uh, <laughs> Stupid question. You know, it's funny when you live here, you don't even think about like wondering what the weather's going to be like. It's like you just wake up and you're like, oh, it's going to be sunny. And uh, <laughs> that's become norm for me. Like, I don't, I don't check the weather. I'm like, oh, it's going to be like in the 80s and sunny. You know, that's. that's yeah, that's like, probably the stupidest question I've yeah. asked in the four years of well, podcasting. Well, <laughs> It's, it's beautiful. Depends, it depends where you live on the island. I mean, there's rainy sides of the island all the time. Right. And, you know, yeah. I'm I'm in the sunny, sunny, you know. You're on the couple, sunny couple, side of life. Sunny side, a couple blocks from the beach. So yeah, I can't complain. I love it. <laughs> That's amazing. Well, happy to hear that. Um, well, so I thought we would, you know where I thought we would start? I thought we would start with a lightning round. I was saving it for the end of podcast, but then I was realizing that I was forgetting to ask. Okay. <laughs> So get it, get, get it done now. Are you ready? This is always fun for me. Good. Okay. So what is your favorite recovery book? Oh, man. Um, I know it's hard to pick just one. Yeah. You know, um, I'm not a huge, like, well, I guess I shouldn't say I'm not a huge recovery book. Um, I think just because it's not in the genre of like the recovery, it's, it's what helped me in my recovery. Mm -hmm. um, there's a book by Brendan Manning called... Abba's child. I know it's a, it's a kind of really odd name, but um, it's it, that book to me was like life changing really? in my recovery because it talked about um, he called it the imposter, uh, but it's like basically like our false self or the 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 lie that we believe about ourselves, <gasps> and it talked about wow. kind of re reframing it and so um, and how and how to do that and like and so that that book was you know powerful in my my recovery but it wouldn't it wouldn't be the one that you would go to like the bookstore and find on the recovery shelf i guess well you know what the really interesting thing about what you just said and tell me the title again did you say all is all, child uh, no abba's child so, oh abba's child yeah i was yeah. like all is child that is weird <laughs> so Ab abba's child so like um uh, but yeah it was a, it was a powerful abba's book. child okay um no so the interesting thing about that is that at the core so there's this idea that we meet people where they are right and so people present with this problem oh my drinking is a problem right. and then we all know in recovery that the problem has nothing to do with the drinking the drinking is a symptom of a deeper yeah. problem and the deeper problem is the lie that we believe about ourselves right so yeah, so like one of my favorite things he did uh, in the book he talks about uh, he wrote a letter to himself, um, his imposter self, like his, so basically like he, instead of being angry at like this false imposter self of him, he thanked him and said like, thank you for getting me through my childhood. You were there when I, I needed to be able to escape. You were there when I needed this. And, and he really like walked through this, like thanking it, being aware of it and then going, but you know what, as I grow, you're going to shrink down. And we're going to, we're going to shift and change where you, you don't need to, I don't need you anymore, but thank you for being there when I did, but I don't now. And I thought like, for me, I was like, Oh, so I remember I did, I sat down and wrote a letter to, to myself of this, like, what do I need to think that that part that helped me survive, survive. Yeah. you know, and then how do I say goodbye? You know, what's so fascinating. I didn't even know we were going to talk about this, but I went to a therapist um, who did process therapy Mm -hmm. And she had me identify, I didn't realize it until you just said it. Uh, she had me identify my critical voice, mm -hmm. right? And what is, and she had me thank it. It was really weird because I'm sitting in a room with this lady and she's like, oh, talk to your critic as if it were sitting in this chair. And, I'm, and right. I go out loud, you want me to talk, <laughs> like talk to the right. chair? Are you high? Yeah. Um, and anyway, so I did what she told me to do. I was paying her. So I was like, I better yeah. do what she tells yeah. me yeah. to okay. do. Let's not lie to her and let's do what she says. So she had me talk to my inner critic mm. and she had me thank her. And it was so interesting because the inner critic's job is to keep you safe. So this right. idea of thanking that person was brilliant, yeah. right? As you were saying, I love that. I'm going to have to read this book. That sounds amazing. But um, she then, because I wanted to cut parts of me out and get rid of them right 
like yeah. spiritual surgery. Let's just cut that out. She's like, you can't really get rid of parts of yourself because they are parts of yourself, right? But right. what she did was she helped me to transform it. She gave that inner critic a new job. She's like, she was talking to my inner critic. She's like, oh, inner critic, what, what other, or do you like this job? And I was like, no, it sucks. I hate it. I'm always the, I always have to be the bitch, <laughs> the yeah. mean person. I hate it. And she's like, well, what job would you like to have? And I was like, I want to be the cruise director. Hmm. <laughs> I want to be like Julie from Love Boat. Yeah. Yeah. And, and do all the fun things. Right. So it was amazing how it was like, we transformed that inner critic and gave her a different job. You know, and that almost sounds like what you were saying that, you know, you, you wrote that. And this was this before you got sober or after? Well, so I mean like, yeah, my sober journey is definitely not one of like, Oh, I joined recovery and I was good. I was like, I've been 10 years at least maybe longer in in and out of the rooms of recovery. Um, and so for me, yeah, it was, it was in the journey of recovery at some point, but it mm. was, uh, but I was kind of okay. one of those, um, crash and burn and then got yeah, sober. Yeah, Like I would get sober and it would be six months and then I'd relapse. And my relapses were always like a one time, one day, one night, like mm. boom, full of shame, guilt, pick myself back up, try again. And I kind of, I kind of ran that cycle for years. That's exhausting. Oh, it was, it was, yeah, it was exhausting. I'm going to get to your whole story, but, yeah. um, I can see how I can quickly get off track with these. <laughs> like, yeah, you're like, you're like, no wonder I asked these questions at the end. You're like, I know, just, right? Cause I, like, yeah, no, but no, this is a great way to start a conversation though. Cause I love yeah. how we just got, jumped right into solution and, and that exercise is magical. I've, I've done it yeah. in, a, in a variety of different ways over the the time I've been sober, but that's really good. Okay. So Abba's Child by Brendan Manning. I will definitely leave that in the show notes. Um, do you have a go-to mantra or quote that you live by? Hmm. Um, like mine is obviously one day at a time because the podcast owed <laughs> uh, I love one day at a time, but it's uh, good, right? It is. It, it, I mean, like, yeah, I mean, mine. We can circle back to that one if nothing yeah, is jumping I mean, out. There's, there's a lot of mantras I tell myself. I think in my day, like choose, like choose, like being present is a really big thing for me. Like present in the moment, present here, like learning. So I guess I don't even know how to define it down into one liner, but like, um, just being learning the ability to be present, and this is all I have. Like this, this moment is, is all I have today. Um, like, I don't even have the rest of this. I don't know. I don't know what the rest of the day looks like because right now I have this conversation with you. Yeah. Does that, is that like a, that's like a Buddhist mentality. Yeah, I kind think of. It, it really is. And like, I've learned to exercise it. I guess mm -hmm. it sounds weird, but like. Exercise uh, it. Yes. Like one Practice. of the ways like they're like, someone was like, find the thing that you do every day that you know you're going to do and then choose to be like, I'm going to just choose to be present at that. And so I chose washing dishes because I got three kids and. I feel like I'm always doing dishes. At some point in the day, I'm going to be doing dishes. You're a good husband. So, so I could choose. I could choose in my doing dishes part, though, to like really be present. Like, what does the mm -hmm. water feel like? What does the soap smell oh, like? Oh, wow. All, and like, and be in that moment. Or I could choose my let my mind just wander. But if I can learn to be present in washing dishes, which no one loves to do, then it, then it can like flow over easier into other parts. Does that make sense? That's like no, that's brilliant. Yeah. That, that's yeah. actually, I mean, it's so funny that genius is in the slim, simplicity of things. Yeah. Right. And you activate your five senses. Like when you're talking about smelling the dish soap, I was like, yeah. 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 And it, it becomes way more enjoyable when you're like, ah, man, I get to do this. And I, and like you feel it and you experience mm. it and it's more gratifying versus I could be grumpy and be like, oh, I got to do dishes. And then my mind, you know, I'm not present with it at all. So. Yeah, no, I typically have taken that time to like listen to podcasts or I'm definitely not where I'm yeah. at, right? Yeah. I'm totally going to try that. Not that I do dishes very often. That's a, that's a <laughs> husband kid, job kid, in my, my house. Are, my kids are getting older. So they, they are slowly, <laughs> oh my God, yeah. they're slowly transitioning to like, I don't ever unload the dishwasher, which is amazing because that used to be my chore as a child and I hate unloading the dishwasher. Yeah, when you have kids, they should yeah. be able to sort laundry and yep, do dishes. They, they, they do laundry and unload dishwasher for sure. Genius, brilliant, free labor. 
Yeah. That's what Not so free labor because they're hella expensive. <laughs> okay. Um, do you have a regular self care recovery routine? Um, for me, it always starts with, um, I, even though my calendar is on my phone every Sunday, I sit down, um, and I write my calendar out on a big calendar that goes on the side of the fridge. Um, and I do this because that's my starting point to actually, cause one of my, some of my things in my recovery routine are self care, which I'm really bad at. Really? Uh, yeah, I just, I, I have a tendency to go, oh, I don't have time to go do this for myself. I don't have time to go surfing by myself. I don't have time to just go s sit at the beach for a minute. I got to do this or be here with the kids or that's too selfish. And so if I don't, I put my calendar out and then I let myself and my wife evaluate it. And we just go, she, she'll be the one to call it out sometimes. Be like, hey, I see you don't have self-care in there. Like, Aww. you know, and I'm like, that's true. Um, so that's my starting point is Sunday calendars get written out for the week, um, for me and, and a lot, you know, and so my, my recovery is, you know, a couple of meetings a week, um, uh, celebrate recovery, a CR meeting that I I'm involved in and go to. And then, then the other parts are, it is self-care, like taking five minutes to get into the ocean at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. You said celebrate recovery. Did you say refuge recovery as well? No, just AA and celebrate. Recovery. Oh, sorry. Okay. So okay. I, have like a, I have a home AA meeting. That's like a 6am meeting that I love good group of people. Um, so that's kind of my go-to. Oh my gosh. So that is so dear to my heart. I, I did a, my podcast is named after my favorite meeting that did, was met at 6am every day. Oh, really? Yeah. For years, for yeah. years. I love, I love starting the morning off with like, just like, and I love this oh. meeting because it's like no fluff. They don't do any yeah. of the inter like stuff. It's literally a 45 minute, you come in, read the daily reflection of the day. Everybody goes around the room and talks about it, shares, and then you're out, you know, and it's just yeah. a good way to start. That's brilliant. Love that. Yeah. Uh, okay. So did you say three meetings a week? Yep. Do you read any daily readers on your own? Um, I, spend, you I have, I have cool. I mean, I have, uh, I have to, for me, I, I take quiet time in the morning. I get up, I try to wake up at five every morning. Uh, I, well, I have young kids. That, so if I don't get up and actually create some own time for me, I'm, I'm, I'm a better human being when I have my own time before my, my children. So yeah, I get up at five and I take, you know, some time and I, I usually journal every morning and kind of reflect back on the day, day before. And then I'm usually reading through some devotional, some daily kind of, read something a little feed your brain yep yeah so it's kind of a little bit a little bit of writing and a little bit of you know something to feed me that okay you're hilarious you just said that you weren't great at it but you wake up at 5 a.m journal reflect and do a daily reader the five <laughs> the five's been new consistency and i think you know okay. you know what you know what's the best part about it i, I would like you to reframe it and say i'm fucking okay. awesome i'm awesome <laughs> self -care. Uh, i i uh you're adorable i love <laughs> I love Christmas because literally like my favorite time is to wake up and plug my Christmas tree in. Oh my God, me too. I'm like, if I can leave this up all year, it motivates me to get out of bed and have my quiet yes. time because, because I'm like, there's just something about like the Christmas lights in the morning that yeah. like my cup of coffee, my Christmas lights and like, Oh, I love it. So feels magical. Yeah. Yay. I love, okay. So you're awesome at self care. Good oh, for you. Okay. And I love that you have sort of an accountability person to be like, Hey, add, add some in. Yeah. Sprinkle yeah, that, a little joy in your calendar. Yeah, find some time, you know, and she's the best because she sees how, like, when I work hard and I'm busy and going. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. I have uh, a new thing I've really started, which is I love, is I got an ice bath. That, uh, oh, hell no. <laughs> well, I live in Hawaii, so it's warm and hot all the time. So, oh, like, you said that's a but, treat. Like, but, like. I'm like, cold. Every, that's everything, amazing. Everything we talked about, like, being present. Yeah. Uh, you're forced to in the ice bath because if you're not, you can't stay in it. Um, oh, my God. How cold is it? Learning to, I usually keep it at like 40, 45. Oh and then like I try to sit in it for like anywhere anywhere between like five and ten minutes. So it's just like a it's like a freestanding. It's always cold. Oh, this is like white trash right here. It's a. Um, a barrel. <laughs> no, it, it's a it's a freezer chest full of water. So you like open up the freezer chest and I just plug it in at certain times throughout the day to keep it at like a certain temperature. So if you That's leave it brilliant. The time, it'll just be a block of ice. A block of ice. But yeah, so you kind of, I have it on a timer that turns on for two hours every day and it holds that temperature. 
That's genius. Yeah, Can I just right? say that is and freaking just, genius? Just make sure you unplug it before you actually get in. You know, just <laughs> probably shouldn't sit in water that's plugged in. So, just saying. Just saying. Good who, know, who knows? I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Okay, genius. They say that that uh, insanity and genius. There's a fine line. <laughs> it's, it's called, I'm sure my na- I'm sure my neighbors like look over the fence and be like, hey, "What is guys, this? You guys in the freezer again? What's he doing? You know." <laughs> He started drinking again. <laughs> yeah, oh, he, he must be drinking. He's sitting he was, in the freezer. He's sitting in the freezer. Oh. Bruh, he's sitting in the freezer. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we, are, we are definitely those, those, those neighbors, and I'm sure the whole neighborhood watches. <laughs> Bunch of weirdos. I love it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so good. Yeah. Okay, I love your routine. Amazing. Um, do you, what is one thing you wish you knew when you first got sober? Oh, man. Uh, I wish I knew how to have grace for myself when I was beginning, you know, I just felt like I had everything had to be done right or perfect or, and anytime I'd describe, I just, I, I, I just didn't, I didn't know how to have grace and compassion oh. for my, for myself. Grace. I could, have it for, I could have it. I could have it for other people really easily, but, uh, I, for myself, I wasn't, I wasn't able to give it to myself. So. That is so good. I mean, we hold ourselves to this crazy standard. We're the only ones who know all the bad stuff that we've done. So yeah. I think it's tough to, that's tough to do. Like everybody in recovery has like a pretty, yeah. I think it's pretty across the board that we all have like this pretty low self-esteem. Yep. And uh, yeah, having compassion is huge. Yeah. Have you ever heard of uh, Tara Brock's uh, Radical Compassion? Mm-mm. Oh my gosh. You have to check it out. It's on Audible. Yeah. And sometimes when I can't sleep at night, I will listen to her voice and, and it's all about how to have compassion for yourself and it puts me to sleep. But you know, what's interesting about that. So I'm doing a bunch of hypnotherapy right now. And they say that in that state, just before you fall asleep, is like when your brain goes into like the theta, I don't know what it is. I forget yeah. what kind of brain waves, but it's like the kind that go right to your subconscious mind. Yeah. Right. And that's where we operate from. So they, so listening to this stuff as I fall asleep and sometimes as I wake up, cause I don't always sleep through the night, yeah. um, I'm getting these positive messages and sort of rewiring my brain, my subconscious and her voice is so soothing and magical. It's a, uh, it's a must have. Oh, wow. Yeah. You're, check it out. I, I feel like after I get done with you, I'm gonna have all these like, I know I'm, 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 uh, I love it. I, is I, it there's, good? There's, it's not yeah, annoying. So, no, I love it. There's so much. I'm like, Oh, I want to listen to that. Oh, I want that. No. I know. Uh, yeah. Stop me if I'm being annoying, but, but um, no, everything you just so said, good. I just think about like, I had a friend recently talk to me and I started researching it. Have you looked into that? Like, um, the, the test they did on the water that froze into ice where they, um, oh yeah. The, uh, when you speak, they, they freeze yeah, the like, waters, the positive yeah. messages, and it's beautiful when you say nice things and it's yep. all distorted when you say mean things to it. Yeah. 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 And then my, my friend was like, you know, we're made up of what 80, 90% of water. Yeah. And so, and then like what we say to ourselves all day long yeah. affects every part of your body. And I was like, Oh, so I like got into it, like really like nerded out on like researching all this and being like, Oh, Oh my gosh. It's so, there's so much truth to yeah. like, even like, as you were saying, like listening to something that feeds positive versus mm-hmm. negative. Um, I mean, all aspects and like, how do we shift like our, what we're telling ourselves all day long to have love, compassion and grace for ourselves, you mm-hmm. know, because yeah, like if, if that, if positive words can change how water freezes into ice and how it looks, it definitely can have an effect on what's going on inside of us. So, yeah, it's, I, we need to pay more attention to our physiology as mm-hmm. well as, I mean, cause we're all made up of energy at the very core. Yeah. Right. I remember taking yeah. a chemistry class and I got through my chemistry. I actually took a test and placed out of it. Like I didn't want to take the class. So I went online to try to teach myself enough chemistry so that I can place right. out of this class. <laughs> and I learned the concepts through uh, recovery concepts I applied like, you know, those little mnemonic devices. So like covalent bonds, how to like codependent. Well, that's two negative bonds mm. attaching to each other. Codependent. That's it's a bad awesome. thing. Bad. You're all, you're all recovery <laughs> negative. Healthy. Yeah. Codependency is negative. It's two negative bonds. And so that's, but um, 
yeah, it's just interesting how we're all just made up of energy at, the, at our very core. And so it is important that we put in positive messages because like you said, like with the physical, like I love the science part of recovery. Like when you're talking about the, the water, like we're mostly made up of water and how the positive messages affect our makeup, our literal makeup, positive, negative energy, our, how we're all held together and and uh, what we're made of it, like whatever you put in comes out. So it's very important yep. to, it's all in your head. You've got to, yep. got to straighten that out. So that's, that's awesome. That's uh, I, I love that. Um, having grace and compassion for self. I feel like uh, recovery is a lot about the self-esteem, yes. love yourself journey. Yeah. So um, that's amazing. Should we, I would love to hear your story. I don't actually know your story. Do you want to take a few minutes and, sure. and talk about, you know, if I'll give you like uh, five, 10 minutes to tell your story and then we'll jump into some solutions. Cause okay. we, I do want to talk about your podcast. Cause you do have a podcast called braving the journey, which I think yep. is such a brilliant name for a podcast. Okay. And um, I've seen some of your guests. They look really amazing. And I want yeah. to talk a little bit about, uh, uh, what are we going to talk about? Oh, we're going to talk about a couple of solutions. So, you know, like the ideas about what works uh, for me might not work for you. So finding your own path. Yep. And we'll talk about dealing with shame too. You have two amazing questions for transformation. Okay. We'll talk about after your story. Cool. Uh, well, yeah, a little bit of my story. Um, so I guess there's, there's value in kind of starting like from the beginning. I grew up in a um, a super loving, amazing house. Um, uh, mm. where, and I say that because, um, that's a lot, uh, not the case a lot of times. Um, so I, I did, I had, I, my parents were still married. Um, they, um, they were both my mom, my mom was actually a marriage and family therapist. Um, so she was like the, the mom that you had to be like, mom, you need, you need to stop counseling me right now. <laughs> uh, but my friends would all use her like, Hey, can, can, I, can I talk to your mom? You know, like, so like uh -huh. great parents growing up, great home. Um, drinking was never a part of my life really um and i kind of was one of those guys in high school beginning of college that whatever i put my mind to i was able to do um you know from the age of 19 started at a nonprofit, uh filming short documentaries around the world um to by the age 21 i'm married now and by 22 i'm a lead pastor of a church um and so yeah, all of a sudden I'm, we're, uh, I'm at this point, you know, married, pastoring this church that's growing, community, but everything up at this point, I, everything I've kind of done, just has succeeded. Like it's working and done well. I, eighteen, built my first house and sold it, made money and started flipping in the real estate game. Like everything was working well for me. Um, and then, the stress for me of being a pastor at a super young age and really felt like. But I believed this, I that I had to have it all figured out and have life all together. And internally inside, I didn't. I was just kind of a, I felt like I was faking it, but I didn't know what to do with that. Um, and so um, three years into our marriage, <clears throat> everything on the outside looks like it's going great. I'm internally just like feeling like a wreck and I have an affair. Um, and I couldn't deal with it. I mean, like I, and so I started uh, at that point is when, you know, I used to be able to go out and just have a couple beers or a beer, or, you know, with friends, but that's when I started utilizing drinking to cope with what I did. Um, and so I would kind of numb out the shame that I felt. Um, because for me, like cheating on my wife was like that thing that I, per you know, it was one of those things like if you would have talked to me before, I would have said, no way, there's no way in my lifetime I would ever do something like that. And then I broke like to me, like the biggest thing I said I never would do. Um, so I came clean um, and shared, told my wife. Um, and that's kind of when my life exploded for me as far as sh my son was just born. So they left. Um, they, they literally just kind of packed up, moved out and headed to Hawaii. We were back in Idaho at this time. And then I lost my job as a pastor and, and then I lost my community you know because that's kind of who I had so at this point all of a sudden like everything for me just kind of went to crap you know I felt like I, I kind of lost it all and um, I still had some people that were standing by me but 
um, at that point is when I really started to drink to kind of medicate the shame and the, the feelings I had. Um, I got into a good, amazing, I'd probably say that this, this man, um, Mark, he was our counselor at the, or my counselor at the time. And I feel like he was probably the one that helped save my marriage. Um, and so started working with him and he was probably the first one to say, Hey, I think you got a drinking issue. And I was willing to entertain the idea for him and my wife and I now at this point are doing marriage counseling where, where she's chosen to say, I'm willing to stay here and work on some things with you. Um, so I, I said, yeah, okay. Like if you guys think I have an issue, I don't, but you guys do I'll go to a, and so that was my beginning introduction to like AA over oh, 12 years ago, I think. And I, I walked through the doors and I was the guy that sat in the back, um, looked at everybody else and said, I don't relate to any of you guys. I'm not an alcoholic, but I'll sit here just to entertain everybody else. And I did that. And then I, then I was able to, um, I would string together like a little bit of time every once in a while, but, um, I became a really good closet alcoholic. You know, I would drink in my car on the way home, um, just enough to not be sloppy drunk, but enough where I felt just kind of numbed out. And that kind of became a, that became a routine for me for years of like, you know, a, the deceit behind it. Um, and I strung together a little bit of time and things on the outside. My wife thought we were, you know, we were doing well. Um, we decided to move to Hawaii. Um, and I just, at one point, for me, stress is a big trigger of mine. Um, and I think at one point stress for work got kind of overloaded. And I just, you know, started slowly drinking again um, and would just just enough to get by. But my breaking point for me was, um, you know, none of the bad stuff. I didn't lose my house. I didn't lose my family. I didn't lose, I, you know, I didn't lose those things. But internally, I lost all my belief in myself. And any, I just, I just saw myself as this just piece of junk. And uh, I remember sitting on the bed in my daughter's room, stealing money out of her piggy bank to go buy more alcohol because if I had to hide it because I couldn't put it on a credit card. So I always had to have a way to, to purchase it, you know, without anybody being able to track it. And so that was, that was my low. That was my, like, this is not who I want to be. This, this is not the, this is not the father I want to be to my children. This is not the husband I want to be to my wife. This is not it. And, um, you know, I, I, through all this, I tried different. I went to an outpatient treatment program. Um, I learned a ton, a ton of knowledge in there. Um, you know, I've been consistently, I, I still, I, you know, I, I just believe in counseling. And so I, I continually see a counselor and, but yeah, it wasn't until I was willing to accept the fact that I was an alcoholic, like really accept it and not, not accept it in like still have shame around it, but accept it in like the way of like, I accept this and it doesn't define me but it's an acceptance of, and it's, there's a, there was, there was something that like switched where it was beautiful and okay for me. And I was able to go like, man, like this is really actually a really neat thing because I can connect in with people in a different way that I never would if I didn't understand this. And so everything, everything about it changed in this, like, I just, uh, there was almost like a gratitude it for being able to like get to live this life of, of sobriety and recovery. Like, because I look at, I look at people now in the rooms of AA and I go, you guys work on yourselves more than most people ever do in their lifetime. And like, there is such a beauty, like people in recovery c can be some of the most healthy human beings um, that are truly that are, are saying, Hey, like I'm committed to like, not just stop drinking. There's a difference between just choosing to say, I'm not going to drink anymore. And someone that's saying, I'm going to, I'm going to be, my life is in recovery. Like, you know, I am shifting how I think, how I view fear, how I, how I handle stress, how I, all of it is all part of recovery. So that's a quick, was that fast? Was that enough?
That was so good. <laughs> that must be, uh, you're like the concise, like hit on the highlights, like a preacher. <laughs> yeah, that was, yeah, there, there. I always sure. figure I'm like, I'll throw it all out there and then be like, you can ask any questions you want in the middle of the <laughs> I don't, I don't. so good yeah. i mean i was you saw me taking notes i always take tons of notes because i learned so much from everybody that i talked to but i mean there's a couple of things that you talked about like for, okay for number one can we just call out like you being a pastor at 22 that is amazing stupid idea <laughs> I, I i i mean like i think yeah as a senior pastor though i like look back i i look at 22 year olds now and i'm like who would follow that guy uh but I did. We had like this growing church. The elders were like all like twice my age. Like it was, it was weird, but you're uh, exhausted and you had the energy and the message. So yeah, you're yeah. up buddy. Yeah. So it was, <laughs> it, you know, it, it was, a. I mean, some of those people that we did that life with, are, we're still just some of the, are some of my deepest friendships, you know? Oh yeah. So. You know, and there's something about I've seen this many, many times. Um, preachers tend to be very charismatic people yeah. and tend to have that same human frailty of falling to that, to having affairs. I don't know how else to say it. I was going to try to find a nice way to say it, oh. um, a more diplomatic way. But it's, And then what really disturbs me is how the community handles it. They usually out the pastor. Yep. I, it's so I, unforgiving. I, I have to say though, um, like one of the board members, he was, so I tell my wife, uh, what I did and she, she leaves and goes, she's like, I'm going to your parents. I was like, Oh, great. Ooh. So I call, I call my parents say, Hey mom, this is what I did. I got to tell we'll, mom. We'll, we'll deal with this later. <gasps> but right now my wife and son are coming. So please take care of them. And then I called the, uh, a friend. Why didn't she go to her parents' house? They didn't live there. They oh. were, they were, they were in Hawaii. So she did eventually go oh, there. Oh, okay. But my, parent, my, my mom, again, like I said, she was like that sanctuary. Oh, right. She's a therapist. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, it was, a, it was the right place to go. It mm -hmm. just meant that I had to make a quick phone call and <laughs> blow up things real fast. Hey, guess what? Uh, you're like the guy with the dynamite. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Boom. <laughs> See you later. Take care of that. Uh, <laughs> but yeah. And so. Might as well I, just burn it all down. I had a friend that was one of the board members of the church or elder boards, whatever, or elder, whatever you want to call these people. Mm -hmm. um, but he was the first guy I called after uh, I told my wife and, and um, he, all he did was he showed up, he came over to my house and he laid and stayed in my, next to me in my bed all night and just cried with me. He didn't, he didn't do anything. He, he just, just was there for you. Just, his presence was there the whole time. Um, and he's still one of my closest oh, friends. Oh, Zach, that is so yeah. sweet. Yeah, he is. He's one of those guys now that, you know, he's got six kids and he shows up to Hawaii with all his six kids and stays at my house. And Oh, that's and, beautiful. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. I so swear. I, I, yeah, yeah I, there's – go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, no. I, I, think, I think that is reality. I think a lot of times ch church is kind of out to pastors. Um, but at the same time, um, I think the shame that people carry – out themselves they, they run away from any sense of community but like there was a lot of part of me that i chose to show back up i showed back up to the lives of a lot of these people and said like hey i'm, I'm yeah, i screwed up but I'm, I'm not running yet and like that was a big part of us we lived in a small town everybody knew my story there was like newspaper articles about like not the affair but me as this like upcoming pastor church guy and then like everybody knew my business so everyone had an opinion everyone Oh, oh, how like, awful. Even my wife's response being like, oh, you shouldn't be back together. Everyone had an opinion. And so we wanted to move. We did. We were like, we want out of this town. What um, happened to the hussy? I mean, <laughs> I'm just kidding. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Kidding. She's gone. She's gone. I'm sorry. The <laughs> scarlet I letter. Oh, uh, I don't know. No, I'm just kidding. I was that girl. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. Let's not talk about that. No, uh, we'll talk about that on your podcast. I know. I'm, I'm, that's, I'm going to write that question down. <laughs> yeah. Uh, why were you a whore? <laughs> Home that's, record. That's my first question I asked everybody. Yes. Uh, <laughs> man, we digressed. I don't know. Where Digress. We're. Okay, so everybody knows your business. Yeah. Well, um, fall business. from grace. You can't be pastor. Did they kick you out of the church? Did they ask you? Were you invited to leave? Um, I was. I was. I was not. A, I was. I lost my job. Um, but I wasn't. I wasn't asked to leave the church. I tried actually. I. I um. I tried to attend and continue to go there and it just, it was more for me. I couldn't do it. I just was like, mm. 
too ashamed uh too ashamed and too uh it was just uh, it was too awkward like i just being like the in the leadership role and of this to, to be like uh, you know and sorry so, um so yeah we okay yeah we got plugged into a different community so good for you that must have been really hard um okay so you guys have been married for a long time now 15 years now yeah 15 years married bless her heart um i feel like a lot of times like we live in this cancel culture you make one mistake and people are like i'm done with you forever oh yeah i think it's yeah, we're, amazing we're, we're definitely the we're, we're not the norm you know like exception uh, to the rule yeah but at the same time i i remember my i think it was my cousin said this to me once um he, he was like, you know, I think he was talking about his marriage and they were going through some tough stuff. He's like, you know, I've already figured out how to deal with my wife's shit. Why would I want to go find someone else's shit to have to deal with? We all <laughs> Let's not start I over. Like, I was like, that's smart. Like, okay. Like, it, there, as simple as that is, I was like, it makes a lot of sense to me. You know, yeah. just, yeah. So. It's tough yeah, to train we, a husband, let me tell you. Yeah. You know, and we, I Actually, mean, my wife and I, 15 years in, we're still working on it. But yeah, I yeah. would definitely say, that, like this you know last year of our marriage has been amazing so oh that's so sweet yeah yeah i mean there is definitely value in in working it out um and sometimes it can be a blessing right i've heard people talk about like what you would think is the worst thing that could happen in a marriage end up being the best thing that could happen because yeah. then they um like all your cards are on the table yeah like all you it's like okay are we gonna deal with this or or not yeah. it's like let's get to the fundamental issues of what really is going on and then you know whether it's the marriage or it's some sort of personal demon that you're yeah. wrestling with it's like all the cards are on the table it's like you have nothing to lose yeah and that's what i think that's what's so beautiful about it is like a lot of times when we put all the cards on the table we have a tendency just to run like just be like okay i'm done i can't deal with this i'm out where like all what the cards on the table and she chose to stay you know and i remember i remember her saying a statement to me she's like you know a lot of times we assume forgiveness to be this like one-time thing like i forgive mm -hmm. you and it's over she's like i've had to learn to like she's like for me forgiveness is like sometimes a, a daily or a minute by minute thing like i have to sometimes wake up ch and choose to say like uh, i'm gonna forgive you today and she's like and i i was like damn that's such a different and beautiful way to see forgiveness though that it's like a choice just like love's a choice like we have to choose how we're going to respond you know and so that yeah. was her choice she chose that no that is a beautiful thing it's and it is um like am i going to choose to dwell on this thing or am i going yeah. to choose to move forward yeah yeah dwell in the past are you going to live in the past or are you going to move forward and i mean I, I know it's a process like recovering from that is a process but i love her process that's yeah the idea just like continual forgiveness that's amazing mm -hmm. and to let you like get past it um what else was i going to ask you stress being the trigger point oh losing your belief in yourself i mean i know growing up you probably grew up in the church too yeah so it's just kind of like a standard in a christian church christian american home yeah. Uh, well, I mean, yeah, kind of. I don't know what the average American yeah. home no, is, no. but <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, I grew up in the church, um, you know, and that was the that was the other thing is like that is one thing I really struggle with and dislike about the church is uh, perfectionism. We, on, we, 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 yeah, we put on this facade that we have to have it all together, like yeah you know, let's put our Sunday best on and show up and I'll smile like life's perfect. And like, I'm sitting here looking around going like, you're depressed, you have anxiety. You know, I have this, we all have issues. But yet, like, for some reason, why is that not the place that, that is probably the number one place we should be able to talk about it and bring it to the table. You know, what you're allowed to talk yeah. about a church is uh, I need some prayers because I'm sick. Yeah. Or s somebody I love is suffering. Yeah. It's never, a, it's never like a legit like, man, I'm, I'm depressed i know you don't yeah. swear but i was no, like but I'm, I, yeah. I'm so depressed for no reason and, I, and that's that yeah that that has always been my biggest tension in the church is like it's like if i really believe in all this stuff like wouldn't this be the place to be in the most raw vulnerable real 
like just being okay, just showing up being like, I'm a mess. And like, that's okay right now. You know? Yeah. I think like what your friend did for you, it's like when you were sad, he just came and was sad with you. Yeah. Like, so you know what he did? You know what the genius of what he did was, is he held space for you to be sad. Yeah. I didn't try to fix it and be like, Hey, let's just solve this real quick or get through this real quick or like nothing. It was just like, that hurts. It should. And like, let's be here in the space. Yeah. He, and I think that's the, the one major um, thing about drinking and doing drugs is there's no, and, and I'm, I'm guilty of this myself is, um, I'm not, maybe not guilty is the great word, but uh, what I notice in my own behavior is that I feel something and then I want to figure out what is the problem and then let's jump into the solution. I don't really, I like to skip over the feeling part, yeah, <laughs> the accepting, right? like, let's not, let's not feel that our feelings, yeah, let's, just, feel it. Yeah. let's just fix it, manage it, whatever. But feeling it, feel your feelings, process them to resolution. That's what I've learned in recovery. Yeah. Yeah, I, I had someone yesterday I've, I've been kind of coaching and working with, and she has a. I, I asked her to make a list of all the things like to see that she sees in the positive of herself. Oh, um, that's she, good. She just doesn't see those. And I was like, I need you to do that. And, but she replied back. She's like, I'm having a really hard time doing this. Um, and it kind of was in this process of a, you know, a friend had recently just passed away, and I'm just really sad. And then so instead of me pushing and saying, like, no, make the list, it was like, cool let's sit in that sadness like let's figure out how to sit there together like lean what in like, what does it look like to be sad okay be sad like don't go medicate it with alcohol don't go find another form of addiction to entertain it to to run from the feeling but like let's just sit in the pain it sucks it hurts it's painful let's be there you know process that yeah and then, we'll, and, then we'll, and then we'll get to that list you know we'll get there but it doesn't have to be right now yeah. No, that's brilliant. I mean, that's what we need to learn. We need to learn how to feel our feelings that yeah. they're not going to let like what you resist persists. So it, 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 it's just the opposite, right? I yeah. mean, I wanted to numb. I like to skip over it, but yeah, feeling the feel like learning how to feel my feelings and acknowledge that it's not going to be forever. I'm going to be able yeah. to get past this. Yeah. Um, but that is how to get past it is to feel it. Yeah. You have to. Yeah. Like, otherwise you're just shoving it down. It's going to poke its head out some other way, you know? And that's, that's just the reality of it. You got yeah. to stop and go, man, why do I, and then ask the question of like, okay, I feel this, it hurts. And then you can learn to ask the question of why, like, why do I feel this? You know, yeah. what, what is the belief that I have around Ooh. this? You know? what, oh my gosh, that is big. What is the yeah. belief? You know what? That's a great segue to your two questions for yeah. transformation that you mentioned. Um, so we were going to talk a little about a little bit about dealing with the shame because you were talking about shame being one of the things that really haunted you and kept you from recovery. Mm -hmm. So you you mentioned two questions um, that I think are are genius. Um, so what are the what are the two questions? Because you were talking about when we were talking before, you said beware of lies that we tell ourselves. Right. So what is what is the solution or response to that? Okay. So yeah, I'll put it like in context for me. So, I mean, like shame is always, shame was a big, big part of me where like shame, I would drink over it. Shame. Um, to, to be honest, shame was the paralyzing part of my life that like, I believed this lie that I had no longer a voice to be heard because I screwed up so bad and so much that, um, I could never be used again. That was kind of my belief. Right. And, and so, when things would creep up in my mind, like little, little things that I would hear and go like, um, you're unworthy of love. Like you're unworthy of your wife's love. You screwed up. Right. Um, so, so that, that say that lie popped into my head I, or that, that thought. So I hear that thought cause we can't control thought thoughts come and go. It's you right. know, what we can choose to do with them. So the thought comes in my mind. Then I've, I've learned to ask the simple question of like, is, is that truth? And, is you know is it truth or not and being able to be aware going no that's not truth um and then begin to replace the lie with truth going okay then what is the truth and that that part the asking the question okay what is the truth requires practice it's not like you're going to just get it oh i know boom this is the truth but it, it required me learning to sit quietly and ask that question so a lot of times and a lot of times I learned to be able to recognize that's not truth 
quicker now. Like, you know, I could, something pops in my mind. I go, man, that's, that's not true about me. Um, and then, so I could stop and go, what is truth? Okay. That I am a loving person. I care. And, and I am lovable. Like, I, you know, pe and being able to reframe that changes everything. Um, and so I find for myself in, in my recovery and in just life, I ask those questions of myself a lot, you know, um, on a daily, like, um, I get impatient with my children and I get stressed out and impatient and I snap and I get like too loud with them. Right. I can believe the lie going, you're a terrible father, you know, or I could reframe it and go, okay, what, what is, well, that's not true. Okay. That's not true. So what is truth? Uh, truth would be, um, you're tired and you, you need some rest and you need some self care because right now you're taking it out and that that's just not you. So you need to refocus, you know? And, and so, but yeah, it just takes practice, I guess, of being able to identify the lie and then replace it with truth. That is, that is really beautiful. Have you ever heard of, a? Uh, here I go again, Byron Katie has like the four questions. It's like, and it's very, it's very similar to this. It, she calls it the work and okay. you can just Google it and there's a free PDF that you can yeah. get, but it's, she has like four questions. I'm probably not going to be able to remember them all, but um, it's, uh, is, is this true? If it's not true, it's, it's sort of like this, but it's like, uh, but it's like the belief if it's not Ooh, true. I think I've heard this. Yeah, um, it's really good. Yeah. But it's, but in the end, it's like, you know, is this true? If, if yes, then I, I don't know what you're supposed to do with that. But if usually it's not true, like the, the lies that we tell ourselves, like yeah. the inner, the, the inner critic is so extreme right. that it's usually whatever you're believing, it's not really true. And then, yeah. but it's like, who would I be without that thought? Hmm. And it's like, oh, what is, what is the opposite of that? And like, you just came to it naturally on your own with like, what is the truth? And, and what I wrote down when you were talking is I am loving yeah. and I am lovable. And really, I feel like that is grace and compassion towards yeah. self, right? That it, I love the idea that it requires practice and you mentioned something very critically important, which is we can't control our thoughts. No, yeah, we, that's, and that's the reality is I think we can take our thoughts captive, but we can't control them, you know? So exactly, thoughts are going to always come in my mind and it's the choice of what do I do with that? I could stuff it, you know, I could try to <laughs> run from it, even though it's inside of me, or I can be aware of it and, and, and take it and reframe it. Stuff, run, or reframe. I like it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're really technical terms. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah. it's, I was like, yeah, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Stuff, run, or distract. You know, I feel yeah. like the purpose of obsession and addiction is all, all addiction is obsession, right? Yeah. And the, the purpose of obsession is to distract us from pain. And yeah. that's your brain trying to protect you from pain. Yeah, no one likes to no. feel, no one, no one loves to feel pain. It's not like we wake up being like, I can't. I mean, not no one. There's some sick people out there. Okay. <laughs> Most people, Most on, people. On, on the general don't wake up and go, man, I can't wait to feel the pain today. You yeah. Know? Yeah. So, yeah. We, I agree. We avoid, we avoid it stuff run or reframe. I like that, but I like the reframing and I love how you do it. Like, is this truth? What is the truth? And then practice the thought I am loving. I am lovable. Yeah. Cause you know why, you know why that's true? Because, um, if you were a crappy person, it wouldn't even occur to you that what you were doing was wrong. True. Yeah. I mean like you wouldn't even like, if I didn't care at all, if I was not a loving person, it wouldn't even occur to me to feel guilty about it. So there, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, even if you could like that, if you could simply be aware of that th thought, like something pops in your head and you're like, Oh, I feel bad about this. Then you can just simply have that truth. Well, if, if I was that crappy person, I wouldn't feel this way. So I must not be. So the, and then it's just learning to ask like, you know, cause I believe that there's like the small conscious voice inside of us that, that can tell us who we are, that we are loving, caring, kindness, all these pieces. But um, having to learn to listen to that instead of the chaos in the world or the chatter, even inside of our own brain, you know, we gotta, we gotta learn to, what voice do we listen to inside of ourselves? Yeah. I remember hearing Marianne Williamson saying something about like, it was this idea that, you know, if the devil walked the planet, you know, it, it would like, 
where's the worst place it could be around the corner or in your head? And I was like, oh yeah. Cause you know how people go, oh, it's all in your mind. Like it's dismissive as if that's not the worst possible place. Yeah. You're like, that's the worst place it could be. That's the worst place. That's just not good. That is not good news. No, no. It's better for it to be like, oh, that's not in your mind. That's down the street. Cause you can run away from that. So. (laughs) Right. Oh, it's all in your head. I feel like that's a, a that is um, an idea that's transmitted to women because women are sort of known for being emotional or whatever. Like I have a sister who would get sick and I I really do believe it was like all in her head, but um, that's like the worst, that's not a dismissive thing. Like that's the worst place it could possibly be. Like that was not good news, but like, like the doctors in her life would dismiss her like oh it's all in your head i can't help you you know what i'm saying yeah but you're like well somebody needs to help me because it's in my head like yeah like that's yeah. the worst place it could be yeah. so yeah. i love this idea of just embracing the feelings embracing and noticing the thoughts like you're talking about noticing the thoughts yeah. and then reframing them with what really is true well and i think that comes down to like like I just always call it self-talk. Like, what is the talk that I'm having, you know, to like, I'm telling myself throughout the whole day, we talk to ourselves probably more than we talk to anybody else or anybody else talks to us. So it's like learning how to take those conversations captive. Otherwise they they can run, you know, when I first got into counseling, that was the biggest thing my, my counselor had me start working with was like learning to take my thoughts and then have a choice to choose what to do with them. You know, mm-hmm. okay, I'm aware of this thought now. What do I do with it? Brilliant. That is so good. Um, was there anything else we were going to cover? Um, oh, you know, the other thing that we were going to cover was, um, you know, what works for you might not work for me. Yeah. yeah. And I think for me, um, I, I, I don't know why this has always been such a heartbeat of mine because um, I don't know if it's, you know, I, I felt like I tried a lot of different things in my recovery process, like 90 meetings in 90 days, um, <laughs> yeah. you know, got to call your sponsor every day at this time, um, all these different pieces. And, you know, I, and then if I felt like I failed, if I didn't do it right, the, you know, wow. if I, I didn't do the 90 meetings in 90 days correctly, and then I, I'm not doing it right. Or, I, and there's a, I, I value the old timers absolutely in the AA program, but you know, a lot of times they're like, well, you got to do it this way. Cause that's how I did it. And I'm like, okay. Like, I think there's wisdom to glean from everything everyone offers and, and that you can learn from. But, um, I guess is what I'm saying is like, you got to figure out what works for you. You know, what, what take all, and the, usually the only way to figure out what works for you is to try a lot of it. Meaning mm-hmm. like I went to an outpatient program and, I learned a ton and it was amazing and great. Um, and it helped, it was part of the puzzle, but I, I just look at recovery as like, there's this massive puzzle in front of us and it takes a lot of pieces. There's not going to be this one magic formula. that's like, this is it. Boom. But it's like, I'm going to add a little bit of this. Um, you know, like you asked at the beginning, like, what is your recovery program? Like self care is just as valuable to me. Like Mm -hmm. taking a moment to, um, my quiet time in the morning is just as valuable to me as AA meetings or, you know, that it requires a balance of all these pieces. And so I guess I just think always for people, I just want to go like, don't judge yourself by what everybody else is doing. Like that may work for them, but you need to figure out what is your recovery look like? What is it? What works for you? Try and try, try something for a significant amount of time, long enough to like really gauge it and go, mm, this works, you know, or this doesn't. Um, and I honestly, I, I believe you got to have somebody like a coach or somebody alongside of you that can help you kind of walk that to, to figure out what works and what doesn't because oh, for sure. our heads will, will, will be like, that didn't work just because it was not, it was pa- too painful. Oh my God, it must not have worked when really you're like, no, that's probably working. You're just, you know, avoiding it now. Yeah. I just need somebody, an outside perspective, yeah. somebody yeah. who's kind of keeping track of what's happening. Yeah. We all, we all need that outside perspectives. Yeah. But that comes back to that, like, and maybe it's me, maybe I'm made too much of a uh, perfectionist on myself, but that comes back to like, I know for me, I have to have a lot of grace on myself in like this whole recovery journey because it's progress, not perfection. Right. You know, mm-hmm. that, that statement. And it is, it's like, am I, cho- am I progressing today forward 
if so, awesome. It's just, I'm not going to have perfection today. No way. You know, I'm probably never going to in my lifetime. No, no, no. Yeah. And it's so funny that we, there's a couple of, uh, listen, I'll just say that I love this one. Like that's what saved my life, but I yeah. learned early on to supplement. It wasn't like this or that for me, I had to have a whole bunch of things. Like I got super into like the course of miracles early in my recovery. Um, I listened to, I used to listen to, uh, there was no podcast, um, <laughs> 26 years ago, there was, uh, there was cassette tapes. That's what there was. And so I had a lot of cassette tapes from Marianne Williamson talking about the course of miracles. It's you either choose love or fear. It's very, a very simple idea, but simple is what I needed. But it, it's so important to, and like you said, um, self, like there's this idea that self knowledge avails us nothing, right? Mm -hmm. It's really about taking action, but it's so important to have somebody else in your life to sort of, you know, it's like the bumpers on a bowling alley lane, yep. like somebody yeah. to just kind of gently keep, keep you on track to the destination. Right. Yeah. I and, always, yeah. You got to have a sounding board of people, yeah. you know? Yeah. that you can trust good people like, that you can yeah. trust. Yeah. There is value in modeling, which is like kind of what the uh, sponsorship thing is about somebody else to take you through the steps and right. like, well, if you want what I have, you have to do what I do. And I kind of get that. And I like sort of the, like the framework of just make a commitment and, and things like that. But I also agree that, you know, the feeling of failure, like if like relapsing carries with it, Shane, like counting days is inherently good and bad in the sense that it's good to reward yourself. Like there's a lot of rewarding that goes on with chips yep. and, and marking milestones and stuff like that, but is also at the same time, a source of shame. Yep. Right. Cause if you relapse and you start over and that it's de very self defeating, there's there's shame and announcing yourself as new again. And oh, I had, I had that. I, I mean, I honestly, I look back, I'm like, I can't believe I kept showing up. Cause I was, I, I was a constant, like couple month relapser. So I was always at the meetings with the, like, Hey, my name's Zach. My first 30 days, always like having to show up and do that over and over again. It's and, humiliating like, there was a point where I was like, this is exhausting. Like, you know, cause like oh, my relapses usually would be like a one-time event. Like, I, and it was so hard for me to like this mind shift of being like, you're telling me I have to cancel out all the work I just did. Right. And finally I had someone say like, no, like, yeah. Like if you, you can restart the clock and count it, you can not count and do whatever you want. But like that one relapse doesn't disqualify everything you did the days before. You right. Yeah. It's a day that you get to look and go, what do I learn from this? What do I need mm -hmm. to change? What's not working? Cause something's not working if you are relapsing. So what's not working and then keep moving forward, you know, keep and moving forward. That yeah. helped me though, because I, I did, I felt like I was like, Oh, it's reset. Start all over. Everything starts again. I screwed up. I failed. So I defeating and so shameful. Yeah. And yeah. So I, it, it's both, I have such mixed feelings about it and it's all perspective. Right. And it's all yeah. in context. There's a lot of context that goes around it, but um, I like the idea of, patchwork recovery like there's so many different modalities available yeah. to us that um why not try them all you know yeah. there's there's no one there is no one way right just like yeah. and it feels very religious to me like you know i that was one of the things that i got away from i grew up in a christian home yeah and and it's this idea that there's only one way and this way is the only way and that kind of mentality really bothers me yeah yeah and i feel like that I was stuck in that with the recovery for a long time of like, AA, that's the only way this is all you can do. And I was like, well, what about therapy? What about, <laughs> yeah. what about like self care? What about like, you know, I do yoga a couple, like hot yoga a couple days a week. And I love it because it, my body's in pain a lot and pain is a, a trigger point for me. If I'm, uh, if I, oh, my body's hurting stress I'll, and pain stress. And pain. If, if my body gets to this like really painful space, I, I know I could drink and it'll go away. You know, and so I have to choose in my recovery to do things that's going to help my body not hurt as much. You yeah. Know? Yeah. So it's, Seems it's like a no brainer. It. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. And I don't, I know we are not, I'm going to speak for you for a second. We are not discrediting 12 step no, programs at I all. Love, I believe it. I believe in 12, I believe yeah, in 12 steps too. hugely. And I, I'm too. constantly kind of working through uh, the 12 steps myself going yeah. like, you know, or with somebody going like, okay, like, yeah. you know, where are we at or, you know, all the steps I think are, and they're magical. The steps they really need to be are. done in an order too. You know, I in do, order. Think, yep. Yep. Like that's, 
I believe in the steps. Uh, I believe in the rooms of AA. Yeah. I love the rooms of AA for the fact that like I can walk into a room and I get to look around and go like, hey, there's a bunch of messed up human beings that like are. And right I love them. every single okay, one of them. Okay, in their brokenness, you know, and that yeah. that's great to me. Yeah, love it. Well, listen, you have um, shared so much wisdom and such great actual practical things that people can actually do that. I mean, I, I'm so grateful for our conversation this morning. If people want to get a hold of you, how do they reach out to you? Uh, best way is just braving the journey, uh, braving the journey.com. You can find braving the journey on Facebook, Instagram. Um, but yeah, braving the journey is kind of where you'll find me on all platforms. Brilliant idea. I love it. Well, listen, Zach, you, it's been a pleasure speaking with you this morning. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much for your time. And I can't wait to talk to you again. Yeah, me too. Thank you. Thanks so much.